today we're going to be looking at are tissues. So what we've learned in our past couple lectures has included everything from the atomic layer down to the molecular layer to the cellular layer. Now we're going to take all of our specialized cells and put them together to form some form of functioning level layer called our tissues. So we'll be able to take a look at our four major layers, understand their origins, understand their function based on their location, and therefore to give you a better idea of how tissue layers work in conjunction together with all four layers to form our target organ. Now what we have is a whole plate of cells. Cells are not independently floating around in buckets of liquid. In fact, there's a level of structure and organization that allows them to function together as a whole unit. And in order for these cells to function as a whole unit, um, what they would need to do is be able to communicate with one another. And the way they do that is that they have cellular junctions. And these junctions depend on their function that will ultimately determine what they will be responsible for whether it be related to communication or simply holding on together to make sure that they don't float away from one another. Our first of our cell junctions we're going to be looking at are gap junctions. Next we're going to look at gap junctions. Gap junctions are proteins that hold adjacent cells together and the functions of these junctions are to allow for transport of stuff whether they be ions, whether they be other proteins, mRNA, in between adjacent cells. Now these gap junctions are not permanently open, meaning they can open and close. Also, what another importance of these gap junctions is to serve as electrical synapses, meaning that the exchange of ions from adjacent cells are going to be crucial for these cells to communicate and function together in terms of nervous communication or hormones. Now, what would be useful for these gap junctions is that they allow for rapid transfer of signals in between adjacent cells. Now imagine, if you were trying to communicate from one cell to another, one way you could do that is to release that protein out of that cell membrane, allow it to diffuse in between the extracellular fluid, and then allow it to be picked up by the other. Now that would take quite some time for those cells to communicate with, with each other, hence those gap junctions which allow that direct transfer from one side to another. Let's use an example of flower dye. At some point you would have seen flowers that have this unique coloring to them where for instance roses may have a purple or even maybe even a blue tint to them on the inside that have spread throughout the entire flower. Now we know that these may be artificial and the way they can do that is that they can inject a dye at a certain point of that flower and through these gap junctions these these, ch uh, these channels in between these, pro between these cells can transfer that dye from one side to another and allow the dye to penetrate the cells and give it that unique covered look. Now tight junctions are another type of that's actually only present in vertebrates. Now the purpose of the tight junction is to create a barrier in between adjacent cells. So think of a layer of cells together and all holding together by, by the presence of claudin and occludin proteins that zipper the plasma membranes together. This actually prevents the passage of ions in between these areas of the plasma membrane so that these ions and molecules can only pass through the cell membrane via diffusion or active transport through the cell. These tight junctions are actually present in areas such as the blood-brain barrier that help separate the circulating blood from the brain's extracellular fluid, which you're going to learn in our next couple lectures. You also see these around capillaries, where these tight junctions will hold together very closely in order to prevent some of the heavier proteins from leaving the blood. Now this is an example of the tight and leaky epithelia that are achieved by the presence of tight junctions, as you can see in this image. Now in between these layers of epithelial cells, which we'll describe later on what the specialized cell actually does, you can see these tight junctions hold these epithelial cells together in a very tight fashion. Now that prevents the presence of these ions from moving in between these adjacent cells due to those zippered tight junctions. And that would actually end up forcing these ions to move specifically through the cell itself. Otherwise, by not being able to make it through in between the epithelial cells, they'll be forced to be transported either passive diffusion, or active transport through the cells to make its way into the surrounding extracellular fluid. Now we're going to take a look at anchoring junctions, of which we see two types. These anchoring junctions hold two adjacent cells together, or they can anchor the cell to the connective tissue matrix that lays right underneath the epithelial tissue. 
There are anchoring junctions with cell adhesion molecules, otherwise known as CAMs. These types you would see are called desmosomes and allow the cells to anchor together. On the other hand, there are also cell matrix attachments which hold these epithelial cells with the underlying connective tissue. Some of these you will see called hemidesmosomes and spot desmosomes. Now, it's not important for you to remember the differences between hemidesmosomes and spot desmosomes, but what you can appreciate here is that desmosomes have the function in cell proliferation and growth, not just adhesive properties. To give you an idea, think of a petri dish that is layered with a whole bunch of cells. Now, what you'll know is that these epithelial tissues, or whatever cells that you're looking at, have a tendency to only grow one layer thick. Why don't these cells start to pile up and grow on top of one another, creating a 3D structure and eventually pouring out of that petri dish? Well, it's due to the presence of these desmosomes that help anchor those cells to that connective tissue. And once all the connective tissue has been connected to the cells, the desmosomes don't have anything to bind to and therefore will start to limit growth within that petri dish. In other words, cells bind to the plate via the desmosomes, and when these desmosomes can't be expressed and cannot attach to anything else, that will limit its growth. So this has Im profound implications in looking at many types of cancers that result in some form of mutation that affects the integrities of the tissues. And therefore, the lack of desmosomes prohibit growth and therefore would grow uncontrollably. Now that you understand the different types of junctions, let's take a look at tissue slices via histology. This is the study of microscopic anatomy of cells and tissue by utilizing equipment that allows for specific slides of tissues to be seen under a microscope, whether using a light microscope or an electron microscope. This gives us, at least the pathologist, the ability to be able to view the underlying structures, the identification of different cells, specialized cells, and organelles and tissues. This also includes sectioning a tissue to introduce a stain and allow the microscope to be able to differentiate different parts of the cell, mainly the nuclei. As you learned from earlier lectures, you know that by studying the nuclei, we can understand the stage of growth, to take a look at the cell's integrity themselves and to understand any pathologies that may arise. Now we won't get too much in embryology, which is that process of differentiation of tissues through the clusters of cells. Do start off with the blastosphere. Of course, we start off with one cell, and as we start to go under rapid mitotic divisions, you'll see that the cell starts to create a spherical blastosphere that will start to differentiate a specific opening called an invagination. With the emergence of this invagination, we'll see that we notice that there's what's called a blastospore, which becomes the anus of the mature animal. And eventually, we start to see different layers that start to form, whether it's an internal layer, external layer, as well as a middle layer, which we'll know later on as a mesoderm. Now we're going to take a look at our four tissue types that are present in vertebrates. These tissue types are organized to form organs, which form the functional systems of the body that we'll be looking at. Now within these organ systems, you're going to see that we do have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. In the next couple slides, we're going to be able to see these in major detail in terms of their, their structure as well as their function. Now the best example that we can use that would demonstrate our four tissue types would be the stomach. And as you can see from the image of the stomach to the right, epithelial tissue is the side that's closest to the lumen of the stomach, rather the empty pouch itself that will fill with food. This epithelial tissue will serve to protect lining of the stomach from the acidic contents of the stomach itself. Now the connective tissue, which the epithelial tissue will connect to via our desmosomes, will provide structural support. Underneath the connective tissue, what you'll see is muscle tissue underneath that allows for the movement. This is going to be a series of smooth muscle that will allow the stomach to churn as it's filled with food and its gastric juices. Now underneath, you'll also see the nervous layer. This is going to be the external layer where this nervous tissue will allow for neurons to communicate with that particular target tissue. Now with our epithelial tissues, the function of the epithelial tissues I described in the last slide is to cover the entire body surface and lines the body cavity itself. So in the case of the stomach, the epithelial is that innermost layer that helps protect the stomach contents from interfering with the underlying stomach lining. We will also see epithelial tissues in the skin that helps protect internal environment from the external environment. You'll see epithelial tissues will also have other duties such as secretion as you'll see in the next slide over.
What I'd like to point out is that, that epithelial cells exhibit polarity, meaning there is an apical surface versus a basal surface. And you can see that in our image on the bottom left. The apical surface is the area that is the free surface that is exposed to the lumen of the stomach, while the basal surface is the one that contains the desmosomes that attach to that underlying connective tissue. And you can see that this connective tissue is named the basement membrane, and the basal lamina is that side that is flush right against that epithelial layer. Now, we have four types of epithelial tissues based on the shape of the cells themselves, where squamous represents the wide epithelial tissues, a flat, wide cells. Cuboidal, we're going to be able to see, is present in ducts, meaning tubes that, tubules that allow for the passage of fluid. These cuboidal epithelial cells we'll see on the next couple slides over. Now, columnar are very tall, column-like epithelial cells as well as transitional, which in the image in the top left are stretchy. We see a combination of that top layer. Transitional epithelial tissues represent the stretchy epithelial tissues, where these epithelial tissues can detect the stretching that occurs. These are present in the bladder. Also, epithelial cells can not only be described by the shape of the cells, but we can also think about how they're organized in terms of layers whether we can start off with a single cell layer thick that are held by tight junctions on the lateral surfaces of the epithelial cells. These are your simple epithelial tissues, meaning one cell layer thick. The other type we can see are called stratified, meaning more than one layer of cells. And again, in our top left image, you can see that there's multiple stacked layers of epithelial tissues that are not necessarily all connected to the basement membrane. They pile on top of one another. There's differentiation based on which side is most exposed to the lumen as opposed to the innermost layer that's attached to the basal lamina itself. Now we can have our epithelial cells that start to differentiate in, in terms of their secretory function, meaning the secretions that are laid out by endocrine and exocrine glands. Now you're going to see that the terms endocrine and exocrine are defined really where, by where the secretion occurs itself. Now before we start, we have to take a look and see what happens in this middle image in regards to this creation of specialized epithelial cells. At the very top you're going to see a surface epithelium and this invagination occurs where this pocket of epithelial cells will start to differentiate. Now at the very bottom of that pocket you'll see we'll start to have genetic expression of secretory function, meaning that these cells only task is to secrete whatever is supposed to be produced. Now, based on whether those secretions are being excreted outside of the epithelial layers or excreted out into the surrounding extracellular fluid, it's going to define what the difference is between exocrine and endocrine epithelial cells. Now, exocrine functions you're going to see include sweat, saliva, mammary glands, as well as bile. And you can see this in the middlemost layer. The secretory cells on the very bottom will secrete whether it's sweat, saliva, milk, or bile, will travel out into the surface epithelium. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that this is only going to be secreted out into, out, out of the skin or out of the lumen itself. This can be secretions that you would see that could be dumped into an internal environment, such as the digestive system, small intestine. Endocrine cells have the same invagination that you can see in the top layer, except we start to lose the connecting cells that attach the surface epithelium to the endocrine themselves. These endocrine glands release secretory products to the interstitial fluid or the surrounding capillaries. Some examples of endocrine tissues that we'll be looking at include testicles, adrenals, and we'll go into much more detail once we reach our endocrine lecture of le in an upcoming section. Now what you can see to the right is a scanning electron microscope of a secretory vessel. These are specialized exocrine glands that are tasked to produce mucus. Now you can see the apical surface contain microvilli, while the basal surface contain the cell manufacturing organelles. Next, let's talk about epithelial polarity. This explains the different sides of epithelial cells in which we're going to have an apical side as well as a basal side. Now we've already established that the basal side is the one that attaches the epithelial cells to the basement membrane via the desmosomes that serve as an anchor to hold our epithelial cells in. Now on the apical surface, this is where we can see the 
free side, a side that's exposed to the lumen. And typically in these cases, you would see extensions such as villi and microvilli, which we go into much more detail in our later lectures. And this helps maximize the surface area on that side, the luminal side, meaning the side that's exposed to that cavity opening. And on the apical side, what you'll also see is you'll also see moist and mucus secreting epithelium that help protect that epithelial cell layer. As I mentioned previously, what we're going to do next is take a look at our four shapes, our cuboidal, columnar, transitional, and squamous epithelial cells. So our first is to take a look at our simple squamous cells, both simple and stratified. Now squamous refers to the shape of these cells in which they are a single layer of flat cells present at sites such as the kidneys as well as the lungs. And what they do is they allow the increased blood flow and increased oxygen diffusion across a very thin layer. Now you can imagine that a single flat layer does allows for maximum transition of gases to move across the epithelial cells into the lumen. Now stratified squamous still consists of flat cells, however, multiple layers, hence the term strata for stratified. And you typically see these in areas that are exposed to multiple stressors, such as pressure, touch, food passage, etc. You see these in areas that line the mouth, the esophagus, the cervix, as well as the skin. So this serves a purpose to protect extra layers so that the sloughing off the, of the top layers promotes the protection of the more basilar cells, the cells at the very bottom of stratified squamous cells, and allows continuous growth to create a multicellular protection. Our cuboidal cells are typically cube-like cells with spherical nuclei. As you can see to the image to the left, you can see the lumen right in the very dead center. Now surrounding that, you're going to see these cube-like cells, and they surround that lumen to allow fluid to flow through. These tubules are typically thicker, not like leaky capillaries that we would have seen that are typically simple squamous type cells. These are much thicker and allow for fluid to only flow through the lumen itself. Our columnar cells are typically column in shape simple columnar cells that are prevalent in our digestive tracts. So in this image to the right, you can see very tall cells with a prominent nuclei. These cells can also be mixed up with goblet cells that end up secreting mucus to aid in digestion. And that serves to protect that particular stomach lining where those goblet cells will produce a thick mucosal layer on the apical side to prevent any of the high acidic environment affecting any of the epithelial cells, connective tissue, muscle, and nerve cells under, underneath. Our transitional epithelial cells resemble both stratified squamous and stratified cuboidal. What we see in transitional cells is both the presence of squamous and cuboidal cells. Now the purpose of these transitional epithelium is to allow for the stretchiness of certain tissue types such as the ureter, bladder, and urethra. So very prominent in the urinary system. And that distension allows the lumen to stretch and the epithelial cells to detect a stretch that can be relayed back to our central nervous system. Endothelium is the conventional name for simple squamous epithelium that lines the interior of the circulatory vessels and the heart. So this simple layer is fairly prominent in the areas that allow for simple diffusion across that simple squamous cell layer. We're going to be seeing this quite a bit more in our cardiovascular lecture where the endothelium is going to have several functions. Connective tissue is the most diverse of the four types and the most abundant throughout the human body. This is because its origin is from the mesenchyme, which originates from the mesoderm. While this isn't wholly important for you to know, it is important to recognize the variety of functions that connective tissues serve, in addition to the tendons and ligaments we're probably more commonly familiar with. Connective tissue is classified into two categories, proper and specialized. Proper is categorized further into dense and loose, where dense includes ligaments and tendons, while loose includes those of adipose and collagen. Skin is a great example of a combination of epithelial tissue towards the surface of the skin, hence the term epidermis, while the deeper layers, such as the dermis, are composed of connective tissue interlaced with collagen fibers. The specialized classification includes blood, cartilage, and bone, which all contain a matrix, a substance that holds it all together. While cartilage and bone may seem fairly obvious as connective tissue, 
Blood also fits within this category because it too has a matrix. This is the blood plasma, the fluid with the consistency of water that contains all the ions, hormones, and proteins dissolved in it. And this matrix, this blood plasma, also carries the red and white blood cells, as well as our platelets. In our cardiovascular lecture, we'll learn more about the blood and its components. Here you can see an example of the mesenchyme that's derived from embryonic connective tissue. You can note that the mesenchyme within the mesoderm is the middle layer of the embryonic layer. Here are additional examples of connective tissue, where we have adipose tissue as part of the connective tissue proper, as well as cartilage. With our example of adipose tissue, you can see within these histological slides that we do have an adipocyte, which is a single cell for adipose. And within that cell, we do have a lipid droplet that's embedded within. You can see the nucleus along the periphery of the lipid droplet, as well as the cytoplasm. These large fat cells provide endocrine function where they send hormonal signals as well as growth factors for more adipocyte development. Furthermore, these examples of connective tissue include bone as well as fibrocartilage. In our example for bone on the left, you can see that bone is a hard calcified matrix that's made of collagen. There are osteocytes that occupy the lumen, that hole that's contained within the bone structure itself. And within our osteocytes, we'll have osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And these two types of cells are responsible for the balance of calcium that's stored within the bone itself. We'll learn a lot more about osteoblasts and osteoclasts in our endocrine lecture. But essentially, our osteoblasts are bone forming, while our osteoclasts are responsible for bone resorption, or the extraction of calcium, or the breakdown of bone. So these two cells work hand in hand in order to maintain bone structure. Now over to the right, you'll see our examples in fibrocartilage. And in the fibrocartilage, we do have what are called chondrocytes, where these collagen fibers line up. So you can imagine, just based on the structure that you can see here, is that these fibrocartilages will have huge tensile strength. They're meant to absorb compressive shock and can be pulled in order to accommodate a load. In this slide, you can see our example of muscle tissue. And as you can guess, muscle tissue is primarily responsible for motion through the method of contraction. We have three major types, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Skeletal, you can imagine, is used in the body in order to move limbs and such. And in the top image, you can see that this is our striated example. Cardiac, on the other hand, is branched, and as you can guess from the name, is mostly located in the heart. And the last is smooth, where it's non-striated, meaning we can't see the stripes that are located within the actual muscle tissue itself, and are spindle-shaped. The last of our specialized cells include nervous cells, or our neurons. I won't spend too much time here, because we've got a whole lecture that's dedicated to the nerve cell itself. Our neurons have one primary function is to respond to stimuli, which come in as sensory information, and transmit impulses in the form of graded potentials as well as action potentials that travel down the length of the axon, which is a major projection that leads either to a neuron, a muscle, or a gland. These stem cells are a particular hot topic in science, as they serve as the undifferentiated cells before they become specialized. In these cells, the DNA is unmodified and unprogrammed. Totipotent, pluripotent, and multipotent are stages at which stem cells are viable to become differentiated cells, which are classified as unipotent. Think of this as the cell's potential, a level of variability in the cells to what it could become. The further that these cells head towards specialization, the less viable it is to become any other type of specialized cell. There's plenty of research that looks at the viability of stem cells for growth of tissue that we do not have the capacity to regrow, such as neurons. As of 2017, there are emerging studies looking at the use of stem cells to regrow neurons of stroke victims. In these histological slides of plant cells, we can see cells at different stages of cellular division. 
in this particular slide, we can see that these cluster of cells are in interphase, which we now know is at a state of increased metabolic activity and cell growth. Here we can see our plant cells that are entering our first phase of mitosis, known as prophase. We can clearly see the nuclear membrane disappearing, the nucleoli disappearing. Also in prophase, we can start to see the chromatin forming chromosomes. In our next stage of cellular division, we have metaphase. Here you can see in metaphase, our chromosomes lining up on one axis of the cell. This is in preparation for dividing up the duplicated DNA that's organized in chromosomes. In anaphase, you can see the chromatids of each chromosome moving to polar opposite sides of the cell. In this last phase, telophase, you can see the chromatids that reach both sides of each cell, as well as the emergence of the nuclear membrane forming around the chromatids. Throughout an individual lifespan, tissues may undergo remodeling through various stages of cell death and growth. This includes events such as menstruation, where an endometrial layer of the uterus grows, then sloughs off and is expelled during menstruation. A phenomenon of cell death occurs through program timing. This is called apoptosis, which essentially is cell suicide, where cells are broken down and phagocytosed by other cells upon death. Now don't confuse this with the term necrosis, which is traumatic cell death, which in many cases is unintentional. This can be caused by exposure to toxins, lack of oxygen, physical trauma to tissues, which cause cells to rupture and the underlying tissue to become damaged, thus triggering an inflammatory response. We do have clinical application for surveying cancerous cells that may be present during a routine pap smear. During a pap smear, a provider will collect a sample of epithelial cells scraped from a cervix for the detection of cancer. Here, the cervix is swabbed and laid out on a slide to be viewed under a microscope. In a laboratory, these cells are dyed and examined to classify cells that may be undergoing different stages of mitosis, or at least preparation for mitosis. In our image to our right, we can see the classification of cervical cells. Here you can note normal cells at the top left as well as our inflammatory precancer and cancer cells, which are starting to undergo DNA duplication, as well as preparation for mitotic division. So in these cases, our cervical cells should not be undergoing mitotic division, and any cases where we do see mitotic division may be indicative of precancerous cells that may undergo uncontrolled mitotic divisions. These can be used as a diagnosis for cancer cells and for early detection of cancer.